Welcome again uh, to the most recent iteration of my virtual uh, weather and climate office hours. Uh, I'm going to try and get on a slightly more uh, regular schedule uh, than I have been. Uh, it's been a little bit irregular lately due to some travel uh, and also the fact that it's just uh, everything is crazy right now. Uh, there's the academic world autumn craziness, which is kind of standard, and then there is the uh, everything in the weather and climate world is, is going nuts all at once kind of craziness, and those are converging with increasing frequency these days. Uh, it certainly makes for, uh, well, let's just say there's never a dull moment. Uh, I was at uh, a White House uh, climate risk event last week, which was really interesting. Uh, I got to meet a lot of folks, uh, federal agencies in person, uh, who I hadn't spoken with before. Uh, and there's some really interesting perspectives and growing concerns, I think, uh, in, in a general sense, about where we're headed and how prepared or not we are, even right now, for the kinds of events that are unfolding all around us. So that was one of the topics of conversation, as well as some very practical considerations as to how we uh, can improve both our understanding of the science and our preparedness for the events as they unfold in the real world. And so we don't get left behind as the climate continues to warm and, and the uh, things like the hy hydrologic cycle accelerate with each increment of a degree of warming. Certainly something we're seeing in fairly dramatic fashion uh, this summer. Uh, so what I really wanted to talk about today, well, there's a couple of things, and since I originally scheduled this session, there's a little bit more to talk about with California weather than there was at the time, so I might briefly touch on that. I want to discuss, um, it won't be a very long discussion, uh, given how things have gone, for, fortunately, uh, California's fire season and what the prospects are moving forward, that's related to the weather discussion as to what's coming up in the near-term future. And then also I wanted to spend most of the time once again, even though I talked about it last time, El Nino and what that might mean for California and the rest of the Western United States. All these things will also be the topic of a blog post uh, that I need to write and publish later this afternoon. So if you want this in written form, uh, then uh, feel free to check in on that as well. I am going to try sharing a few graphics again. I won't have any of the really uh, weather channel style live radar going since there's not much to talk about uh, in that respect in California right now uh, You may see that again in the future uh, now the hardware has been upgraded and should be able to handle that again uh, Next time there is a particularly extreme weather event in California So I won't be able to walk everyone through every storm that way There's just not enough time but when there are truly exceptional events in California fire events uh, storm events flood events whatever that might be uh, I will try to do that as I'm able to do some live sessions uh, with satellite, radar, real-time imagery, walk folks through what's going on. So today, uh, I won't, I'll just be doing a lesser version of that, looking at some static maps, uh, talking about what might happen a few months in the future, and some of the context surrounding that. So uh, continuing to sort of expand and test out some new options for these live sessions. Uh, so far, it looks like everything's going... Uh, pretty good uh, right now after I adjusted the volume. The only thing I can notice right now is the white balance is a little off. That can be adjusted. <clears throat> that I can adjust later. I'm not gonna worry about it too much today. Uh, the one thing I, I did wanna look out for on the tech side was if those uh, irritating camera flashes are gone, those visual artifacts that started to show up in the last few sessions where there was just these random pixelated white or, or things popping up on screen. I haven't seen them so far although I don't uh, continuously look at the screen when I do these. So let me know if you see those. There shouldn't be any. It's a brand new camera. Uh, if there aren't any, it really does suggest it probably was the camera. As much as I don't like to replace uh, e electronic equipment, I mean, it, it certainly has gotten some heavy use over the past three or four years, so perhaps I shouldn't be too surprised that it was time for something new. Uh, so do let me know, though, if you see those flashes. Uh, I sincerely hope not, and maybe that's another item we can check off the list. Uh, next thing I want to do is uh, install some more uh, sound insulation um, with the, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the low-tech long pushpin solution because I can't apparently uh, use any adhesives on the walls here. Uh, anyway, so let's launch in. So I think 
the first thing I want to talk about is the weather in California in the short term right now. Probably the most interesting and important thing going on is there is a red flag warning. So there are elevated fire weather conditions in portions of Northern California right now, uh, particularly the Northern, <clears throat> excuse me, the Northern Sacramento Valley and the foothills surrounding it. Um, it's not a super critical, super extreme fire weather event though. I mean, it's sort of, it, it does hit red flag warning criteria. So there, you know, if there's an ignition today, it could take off, but the reality is Fire weather conditions in California this year just aren't as ext nearly as extreme as we've seen in most recent seasons. And the interesting thing is this was largely predicted. This was a successful seasonal scale prediction regarding what the fire season might look like. In fact, this was a prediction that was made as early as March and April and was consistent through the spring and early summer. Why is that? Interestingly, when it comes to the seasonal scale fire activity predictions in California, it's not really because we're great at predicting summer conditions or peak fire season conditions. Instead, it's that the antecedent moisture levels are so predictive and so critically important uh, that that information we sort of have in hand before fire season ever really gets going. So it turns out that does lend us a fair bit of predictability. Now, it doesn't tell us everything. We've seen some surprise years. 2017 is a good example of a year that was very wet, but then ended up being record warm and dry in the summer and autumn, and we saw terrible fires in autumn 2017, despite a record wet winter preceding it in some places in Northern California. This year, though, we had a very wet to record wet winter in some parts of central California, followed by a cool and fairly damp spring throughout the state, and then a summer that was not exceptionally hot in most places, and in fact brought some unusual significant summer rainfall to much of the state. Clearly, that's a pattern that favors reduced vegetation dryness and reduced fire activity. So uh, perhaps at the beginning of the season, we couldn't have known just how profoundly uh, this summer's weather would favor reduced fire activity this year, but there was a widespread ex expectation that most of California would see a relatively mild fire season, certainly in comparison to recent years, because of the fact that this winter was cool and wet and we saw lots of snow in the mountains, so there was a widespread expectation there would not be an active fire season in the high Sierra this year, and indeed there has essentially been no fire activity at high elevations. Uh, there have been some fires elsewhere, as you'd expect in any year uh, in California. The summer is, of course, the, the dry season, although this year there's been a significant amount of rain in places that don't normally see it. Of course, most recently associated with hurricane uh, or tropical storm as it made uh, land, uh, landfall near California, uh, bringing record amounts of summer rainfall. In fact, that brought the wettest summer day on record to much of Southern California, along with some significant flooding. So, but the silver lining there is that, you know, we really did damp down, uh, tamp down fire season uh, across most of Southern California, and that includes the Southern Sierra Nevada as well. Uh, the Central and Northern Sierra were already still pretty residually damp from this winter and spring. Uh, so the, really the only part of California where fire season has gotten going at this point is Northwestern California, where things have been quite active up in the northwestern corner of the state and in southwestern Oregon. It's been a pretty serious fire season up there. I will say the structure losses have not been tremendous, fortunately, but these fires have been burning for a long time. They're pretty big. Some of them have been fairly high intensity at times, although not extreme, and they have produced a lot of smoke. And in fact, that's what we're seeing this week across all of Northern California, including Sacramento uh, to the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, pretty uh, bad air quality from the smoke from these fires up in northwestern California and southwestern Oregon. So this is another example of relatively long-range wildfire smoke transport. Even though fire season in central California has been pretty, quite mild, really, uh, there are still significant wildfire smoke impacts this year from fires to the north. So just an example of how if uh, even if you're not having a bad fire season locally, you can still get wildfire impacts, particularly as it relates to smoke and the air pollution and the public health implications of all of that, uh, which are quite significant, uh, even if the fires are hundreds or in the case of other parts of North America earlier this summer, thousands of miles away, places like New York City and Washington DC seeing terrible, dangerously bad air quality from wildfires in Western Canada, so on the far other side of the continent. So this isn't quite as extreme but it is another example of long-range smoke transport. 
There is some good news even here though, uh, because the air quality will slowly be improving over the next couple of days, and then might really improve as we get closer uh, to the weekend and early next week, because there is now uh, an expectation that a relatively strong early season atmospheric river might make landfall up in Washington and Oregon uh, a few days from now. And it may affect far northern California as well, which is precisely where these fires are actually burning this year. It's the only part of California that has seen significant fire activity this year, and it's slated to get some significant one to two inch rainfall uh, at some point between now and uh, five or six days from now. Uh, so that is actually good news up there. It doesn't look like it's going to be extreme rainfall, so I don't think that post-fire flood risk is going to be all that high. You never know. There are There is always an elevated risk of some debris flows or flooding with any rainfall in recently burned areas, but to be quite honest, this looks mostly like a beneficial storm for Oregon and far northern California because there are active fires burning. The air quality has been really bad. This is really going to help with those things. Uh, so it may not fully extinguish these fires. A lot of the fires burning up there right now are in heavy, heavy timber, but it really will dramatically reduce fire activity. And if it's followed up by another rain event, that might really be the end of fire season up there. So I, I don't think we can call it just with one rain event, but it definitely is going to help a lot. And in particular, it's going to dramatically improve air quality. So that rain may or may not extend a bit farther south. Some rain is possible as far south as sort of the I-80, Interstate 80 corridor from the Bay Area into the Tahoe area. There won't be an inch or two of rain that far south. It'll probably be closer to a tenth or two. So enough to get the ground wet, temporarily uh, tamp down uh, fire risk, even if there is, uh, even if there are winds. Uh, but uh, probably not a fire season ending event in Central California. So I don't think even if the North Bay and the Northern Sierra see some rain out of this, I don't think it will necessarily end fire season, although of course it will continue to moderate whatever uh, likelihood of fires uh, will arise in the coming weeks. So uh, up in far Northern California, um, this could potentially be the end, especially if it's followed up by another event. In Central California, this will not mark the end of fire season, but it certainly won't make fire season worse, and it already hasn't been a very severe fire season there. And then, uh, it, you know, it, it, in terms of what we're going to see in, in the weeks and months to come, well, it really just depends. Is this a one and done kind of rain event early? It certainly helps, but it might not completely uh, preclude fire risk if we get uh, dry offshore winds again later in October, which is very possible. That is the peak month for it. Uh, but, you know, right now, there just hasn't been that much activity because of these relatively damp and cool antecedent conditions. I think what this really illustrates is that the antecedent conditions really do matter. Uh, so I, I think that the, 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 the lesson broadly is not just that, you know, in a warming climate, we're seeing increasing exceptional periods of dryness and therefore increasing wildfire severity and, 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 and damages, which we are, but it's also the case that in windows where we don't see those extremely dry conditions, and there will be windows like that in a warming climate with our increasing hydroclimate whiplash in California, that means, yes, drier dries, but also wetter wets. I don't think we'll see very many years as cool as this one, but we certainly will see years as wet as this one moving forward. And so I do think what we're going to see are years where there's not a lot of fire activity in California. And that's good news because it means that we will get some reprieves. There will be years then where if we, if we play our cards right, we might be able to do a lot of wildfire mitigation at relatively low risk because this year, for example, there have not been in California a lot of competition for firefighting resources. If we had had uh, more uh, money and more staff allocated to doing prescribed burns this year, for example, uh, they would have been able to accomplish quite a lot. There have, has, of course, been some prescribed burning going on, uh, but we have some internal numbers uh, that uh, are related to a forthcoming paper that I'll be talking about that was recently accepted. Uh, we'll talk more about that once it's uh, once the embargo lifts. But the observations for this year, which are only indirectly related to that, suggest that there were a lot of days this year that were meteorologically favorable for prescribed fire, and there wasn't a whole lot of prescribed fire going on on most of those days. 
So this is sort of an example of the kind of year where we probably could do a lot of that work if there were people and staffing available and funding available, critically, to do it. Uh, where years where we're not distracted by ongoing fire catastrophes, for, fortunately, and we have some bandwidth to potentially mitigate the next ones. We're not doing that at the scale that we need to be, but it, we'll have a lot more to say about that once our paper comes out, uh, probably in the next couple of weeks. So I'll be doing a, a live session surrounding our prescribed fire and climate change paper at that time. I'll have a blog post, uh, and actually one of my co-authors on that paper at the Nature Conservancy is going to be writing a second blog post for the journal itself that will come out again just after the the embargo lifts on that paper. So journalists, if you're interested, feel re feel free to reach out, um, coordinate uh, conversations surrounding that. But I think there are some interesting lessons we'll be able to talk about in the context of this year, where we have not seen a severe fire season in California, and you know this is an example of one of the break years. How long will it last? Well, it depends how long the wet conditions last. Uh, we might get another wet winter. That's something I'm going to talk about next. Uh, but there will inevitably be years that are much hotter and drier than what we just saw. So we will see those extreme fire seasons return. But we'll also get these breaks. It's not just going to get worse and worse and worse consecutively every year. There's still variability. There will still be wet years. There will still be reprieve years. It is sort of a good news, bad news situation in the sense that the wet periods are what will allow for growth and regrowth of all that vegetation in recent burn areas. And so rather than a climate that's just drier and hotter all the time, where you might actually start to lose some of the vegetation that can burn in this alternating back and forth between wet uh, and then extremely hot and dry in alternate years or clusters of years, it does mean that you sort of have these regrowth periods with lower fire activity and then potentially these huge extreme fire year periods where you burn a lot of that vegetation that has grown or regrown. So that may be the dynamic moving forward. Right now, it's rather nice to be in a window where there, where there, there aren't ongoing concurrent fire crises in multiple parts of the state. Uh, that has, you know, we've had a lot of recent autumns where uh, around this time, things have been just going uh, south very quickly, uh, where fire conditions have been quite extreme. and. That is simply not the case right now. With the upcoming weather, it might be even less the case because the one part of the state that's seen fires is going to see some significant rain in the next few days. And there's no obvious uh, you know, large-scale offshore wind events on the horizon either. So again, ironically as I say this, there is a red flag warning in effect today for a few more hours in parts of Northern California. Uh, and there could be fire activity during that red flag window. But this is not, you know, an extreme situation. The winds are, are, are rather modest. It's just pretty dry right now uh, in those regions, but it's not exceptionally so, and the winds are not extreme. So assuming we get through today, all right, I think we'll be in relatively good shape moving forward, even though there still could be a reemergence of elevated fire weather conditions. If we get a strong offshore wind event later this season, uh, it won't be, I don't think we're going to see the kinds of really dire uh, offshore wind, uh, extremely dry vegetation combinations that we've seen in some recent years. So uh, a reprieve, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take it. So that's fire season, and that's the upcoming weather. Again, I don't think it'll rain much uh, south of San Francisco. It might rain a little bit around San Francisco, and then more significantly up on the north coast, but still, it's welcome this time of year. Any rain you get this time of year uh, sort of uh, inhibits the future fire risk in the, in the fall uh, during the inevitable uh, offshore wind events that will eventually follow at some point, probably. Uh, all right, uh, so I think I've covered fire season and the weather to come. I want to dive back into El Nino and then take some questions. Uh, and I think the, the, the most interesting piece of what I'm seeing, and I'm going to pull up some maps here, so bear with me. Hopefully nothing, uh, nothing goes too crazy. But I think I just want to turn this on. There we go. Should be up on screen momentarily. Uh, so what you'll see once this pops up on screen, it might already be there. There's about a 30 second lag uh, between what I see and what I've actually been saying uh, is, let's see here. So this is a map. There it is. So this is a map of uh, global ocean temperature anomalies. Uh, what does that mean? It's the departure from average, uh, essentially, 
on a on a point by point basis. So you're only comparing a specific place to its its localized typical temperature. So you're not comparing the tropical ocean to the Arctic. That wouldn't make a lot of sense. You're saying that in places where it's yellow, orange, or red, it's warmer than it would normally be this time of year at that location specifically. And there's a few things I wanted to point out here. Uh, one is that there's a whole lot of yellow, orange, and red in the global oceans. In fact, it's the global oceans are mostly at least yellow and orange. There's a couple of patches of, of weak blue, so where things are slightly cooler than average, but those are greatly outweighed by the, the, the magnitude and the breadth, in a geographic sense, of the warmth of the global oceans elsewhere. And Although there are a lot of places I could point to, I, I highlighted four regions in these black boxes for a few reasons. Because A, these are the regions where presently, and this was a map as of a couple of days ago, so it's essentially up to date. These are the regions where the ocean surface temperatures are most anomalously warm at present. So that includes, uh, I guess I can start the box in the eastern tropical Pacific Ocean, so west of the west coast of south of uh, tropical South America, uh, that's the essentially the El Nino uh, anomaly. So the, 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 these are the unusually warm uh, ocean surface temperatures associated with the warm phase of the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Uh, this is that strong El Nino event we keep hearing about, and of course, when you look at it, it does look increasingly impressive. This is an east basin centered event, so notice that the black box is in the eastern Pacific, not in the central Pacific. This is not an El Nino Modoki, as it's called, um, which is quite a compound of Spanish and Japanese words to describe a fairly specific uh, coupled ocean atmosphere uh, phenomenon, which is always interesting result of uh, international science collaborations. Uh, but to be clear, this is not one of those El Nino Modoki events. This is not one of those uh, Central Pacific El Nino events. This is a pretty classic, strong, East Basin centered event. And the reason I bring that up is a lot of research has suggested that the implications for the West Coast of North America are different if El Nino is centered more along the coast of Peru, so in the far Eastern Pacific, or if it's centered uh, south of Hawaii, uh, essentially a Central Pacific event. Uh, so this is one of the uh, more classic events that you would come to associate with a true, strong East Pacific centered event. And that's present. So this has developed essentially as predicted. So this is a validation of the seasonal prediction that suggested by this point we'd see a borderline strong El Nino conditions. That's exactly what we see right now with the Nino 3.4 index about 1.5 Celsius above average. That's right on the border, right on the cusp. Of a strong event if it's if it's sustained for a couple of months. The other regions though I wanted to highlight are notably not in the tropics and that's sort of why I highlight them. So this is includes the North Pacific Ocean so really all the way from the coast near California all the way west to Japan and in particular the western the northwestern Pacific right off the coast of Japan. Ocean surface temperature anomalies there are more than 5 C or approaching 10 degrees Fahrenheit in the ocean above average. And they've been that way in the Northwestern Pacific near the coast of Japan for essentially the whole summer. That is an extraordinarily persistent and extreme ocean temperature anomaly. And this is why many places in Japan have been shattering temperature record after temperature record after temperature record for months now uh, on land, because these oceans are just astonishingly warm in that part of the ocean. But notice that that extends all the way across the North Pacific Ocean, all the way from Japan to California. The anomalies are uh, merely a couple of degrees centigrade above average west of California, which is still significant. But again, they're over five degrees, uh, approaching nine or 10 degrees Fahrenheit in some places uh, near Japan. The other region I wanted to draw your attention to is the Northwest Atlantic Ocean, where ocean temperature anomalies are similarly extreme, over 5 degrees centigrade, uh, in some cases approaching 9 or 10 degrees Fahrenheit again. That's been persistent much of the summer as well. Both of these regions are also embedded in essentially an entire basin, so the North Pacific and the North Atlantic, that are also broadly warmer than average. So these extremely warmer than average conditions are embedded in the context of conditions that are already warmer than average on a pretty widespread basis. So 
these are pretty extraordinary anomalies. And it, the last one is up in the Kara Sea in the Arctic Ocean region. Uh, again, get another region. And in this case, it's mainly because the sea ice is greatly reduced relative to historical norms. But as that sea ice uh, retracts northward, you can actually get quite a lot of ocean warming in the high Arctic because the Arctic Ocean is a sh relatively shallow sea and it, it gets exposed to essentially 24 hours of continuous sunlight in the summer. So if the ice uh, peels back, that dark ocean can warm pretty quickly and indeed it has. There are any number of other regions I could point out too. The Indian Ocean is very warm as well. But the reason I point this out is that El Nino right now is not the only game in town. So there are a bunch of different extreme warm blobs. And the one that we understand the best is probably the one in the tropics. That is clearly associated with El Nino. We know that El Nino is a natural process. We've seen El Nino before. We know largely how it behaves. But what we've never seen before is a strong El Nino event of this magnitude combined with record-breaking ocean temperatures in so many other places concurrently. So that is a pretty different situation. And the reason why, it's, why it matters is that essentially we have uh, not only a novel combination, I realize I've just gone behind my graphic here, so I'm gonna scoot in the wrong direction. That's what happens when you mirror a camera, I kind of forget which direction is the right one to scoot to. Um, the reason I bring that up is that the, uh, what we call teleconnections associated with El Nino, so the geographically remote effects of this tropical ocean warming, are largely dependent uh, on the, uh, the Rosby waves. So these, these as I mentioned this uh, in the last conversation, they're largely dependent on what's known as a Rosby wave train that emanates from the tropics and enters the mid-latitudes. Think of this as essentially waves in the upper atmosphere, uh, waves in the jet stream. Uh, and they occur because the location, the longitude, so in a, in a, in a west-east sense along the tropics, uh, on this map, where those deep tropical thunderstorm, thunderstorms tend to form, shifts eastward with El Nino and then back west westward during La Nina. The longitudinal position of those deep tropical thunderstorms largely dictates whether or not and where that Rosby wave train sets up. And so with a strong east-based El Nino event, we would often expect it to set up in a place that favors increased precipitation across much of the Pacific Southwest uh, in winter, including much of Central and Southern California and possibly other parts of the state too, as well as Arizona and New Mexico. Uh, but the challenge is, the other thing that happens is we see this strengthening of the subtropical jet stream in the Pacific. So we see a deepening of the Aleutian Low, a strengthening of the subtropical jet stream, and it is that subtropical jet that often brings the increased rainfall to Central and Southern California during strong east-based El Nino winters. So what's interesting about that is that this year, in addition to that El Nino warming in the tropics, we also have this quite pronounced non-El Nino warming in the mid-latitudes. And that might somewhat interfere either with the Rosby wave response itself or with the strengthening of that subtropical jet stream because the subtropical jet is set up largely by the poleward temperature differential in the atmosphere, known as the thermal wind. I won't get into the details of that since this is not a meteorology lecture, but the point is, the sharper the contrast between the warm tropics and the cool mid-latitudes in Arctic, the stronger the, the jet stream uh, can potentially become. If all, you leave all else equal and warm the tropics, well, you're, you're warming the already warm place, and so the differential would generally increase. But in this case, we are warming the already warm place, which would act to increase that meridional temperature differential, but we're also warming the mid-latitudes, which is going to warm a cooler place, which would tend to decrease, or at least uh, mitigate that increase in the overall temperature differential that helps drive the jet stream. Now, these are ocean temperatures, but they can be extended to a certain extent to the overlying atmospheric temperatures because there's a lot of heat flux between the surface oceans and the lower atmosphere. So it's not quite one-to-one, -one, but at the scale of, of, of entire ocean basins, this is a process that can matter because the, the, the regions of maximum temperature, temperature differential in the oceans are, uh, often coincide with the regions of maximum temperature, temperature differentials in the atmosphere, which then can feed back into 
where and how strong the jet stream is. So that might actually interfere a bit with this El Nino teleconnection because we have so much warmth in different places other than the El Nino region, and we really haven't seen that level of warmth historically in non-El Nino regions. So the Nino 3.4 index is not historically unprecedented, but a lot of these other black box regions are. So that's the challenge. So where does that leave us? Well, it leaves us in a little bit of limbo because the, normally with a strong east-based El Nino event, there'd be some pretty clear-cut predictors for California precipitation this winter, which is to say that the second half of winter from about January through March, would, it would be rather likely to be wetter than usual, especially in central and southern California and along the coast of California, as well as in Arizona and New Mexico. This year, I still think that is going to be the best prediction that we can make. So the tilt and the odds probably will be towards a wetter than average winter, at least in central and southern California, and possibly in northern California as well, but with greater uncertainty than usual. Uh, so let's dive into that a little bit more. I want to pull up a slightly different graphic. Let's see if I can do that without breaking my computer. Um, let's just see here what this what has popped up. Share a different image here. I do need to uh, practice some of the screen sharing because uh, in, in the future it would be nice for it to be totally seamless. Uh, but let me just see here if I can change. Okay, so now I've gotten rid of it. I think I just need to add a new one. Bear with me for one more moment. Maybe you'll get an infinite, infinite zoom window perhaps. Hopefully not. Almost there. I will figure out how to do this a little bit more seamlessly. One more moment here and we've got it. Okay, well, we'll bring them up one at a time. So what you see on screen now uh, is a graphic that is illustrating the uh, European seasonal model uh, ensemble prediction for January through March. And I am focusing on the latter half of winter because that is the time of year when El Nino's teleconnections tend to be most robust. So. I honestly don't have really any idea what's going to happen this autumn in California. Uh, there isn't a strong predictive signal towards wet or dry. I wouldn't be tremendously surprised if either happened. But of course, the autumn and even into December is often not nearly as wet as January through March, particularly during El Nino years, and so that's what I'm focusing on. Lo and behold, there is a signal that emerges January through March with the expectation of a strong El Nino event during that continuing during into that time, perhaps weakening uh, but the influence will still be pronounced that time of year. Uh, the, this particular map is showing not the uh, predicted median or average change from average in winter precipitation, but it's showing the likelihood, the probabilistic likelihood, according to the broader ensemble of all the members of the ECMWF seasonal model, that the precipitation from January through March will uh, end up uh, in the wettest third of all such January through March period. So essentially it's saying, what is the likelihood that this January through March will be among the wettest January through Marches uh, in the broader distribution? And what it's saying here is that there is a signal, uh, an, an increased tilt in the odds, if you will, especially for central and southern California, uh, about 40 to 60% chance that that part of the state ends up uh, seeing conditions that are significantly wetter than average uh, in the top third of wet January through uh, March periods. Now that's not a tremendously extreme tilt in the odds. It does suggest that of course there's if there's a 40 to 60 percent chance that this happens that there is that there is a significant chance that something else happens 
uh, other than uh, a very wet January through March period. But it does tell us that right now, if you had to put money on it, the good money would probably be on a significantly wetter than average second half to winter in particular, uh, which is the wettest time of year in Central and Southern California, in fact, uh, this year mainly because of the strong east-based El Nino event we, we see. Uh, and there, of course, there are some other areas on the map with, with brighter red. Uh, Florida stands out as one place that's very likely to see a wet winter this year. Uh, and some parts, uh, uh, other parts of the, of the oceans. But since this is a California-centric audience, I'm going to focus on the West Coast. But I will briefly mention the opposite uh, situation here. Uh, and I just wanted to add one more window here. Let me see if I can add an additional window. Uh, not that window. Uh, I'm going to remove this one. Add one more. Just one more second here, and there we go. Okay, and now on top of that window, on your screen, you now see, uh, oh, sorry, you're seeing my whole screen here. So I definitely need to make that a little more seamless. But anyway, uh, this other window here, this is now showing again from the ECMWF seasonal ensemble, uh, a similar plot, but for the likelihood of ending up in the driest third of January through March periods on record, according to the same models. And this is interesting uh, because Let's look at California, which is not emphasized here. There is not a, a, a decreased chance of ending up in the driest third of years, according to the ensemble this year. So wait a minute, how does that work? If there's an increased chance of seeing a really wet winter, but also near average odds of seeing a dry winter, how does that math work out? Well, it pretty much means that in the distribution from this particular model ensemble, there are very few members that's where we see average precipitation this winter. So there are more members that see both very wet conditions or very dry conditions than anywhere who ends up in the middle. And there is there are more very wet members than very dry members of that ensemble, but there are both. So what does this tell us? Well, it still tells us something interesting about California's winter uh, odds this year. Uh, and what it tells us is that any outcome is possible, a dry winter, a near average winter or a wet winter. If you had to put money on it though, the single likeliest outcome is an unusually wet winter. But the odds of an unusually dry winter are largely the same as they would be at background. So the thing that we're unlikely to see is a near average winter this year. So it'll, it, the, the odds of it being extreme in some fashion, probably on the wet side, but maybe also on the dry side uh, with lesser odds are both on the table. This is kind of an interesting situation because it suggests that there are some all or nothing kinds of processes at play. And what I'm guessing is going on here is there are essentially two competing factors. One is, of course, El Nino and the deepening of the Aleutian Low and the strengthening of the subtropical jet stream that we're almost certainly going to see. But that might be in competition with some weakening of the subtropical jet stream, uh, uh, contrarily, contributed by these unusually warm mid-latitude ocean temperatures not associated with El Nino. And on top of that, there's the potential that those unusually warm mid-latitude ocean temperatures, in other words, the Pacific closer to California, might also help to juice up those storms that do form. So irrespective of what happens to the jet stream, there may perhaps be more moisture available to the atmospheric rivers that we do see this winter because the near shore ocean is considerably warmer than average and is expected to remain so. So that's kind of an interesting situation. I don't know exactly, it's really not clear exactly to what extent these unusually or record warm non-tropical ocean temperatures might mess up the relationship we'd normally expect to see with El Nino. It ha certainly has the potential to do so. And if it is there, it should be in the models. This should be something they're capable of capturing. But in this case, it looks like there's a little bit of a bifurcation across members. There are more members producing really wet conditions over California this winter 
than any other single outcome, but there are at least some members still producing a pretty dry winter across California, which tells me that there perhaps is some, uh, some significant spread. There's quite a divergence, even from the initial conditions we have in place today with the same modeling framework. This is one of those situations where there may be irreducible uncertainty, where we just won't know. And we probably have to prepare. Uh, in this case, it would be wise to prepare for a very wet winter for two reasons. One, we just had one, and the implications of having another one consecutively are greater. Uh, in fact, right now, we're not so worried about water scarcity in California. We're probably more concerned about the potential for faster and more intense runoff from winter storms because things never fully dried out from last year, especially with the summer rain we got from Hillary, particularly in Central and Southern California, which are precisely the parts of the state that have the highest odds of an unusually wet winter this year. There are some concerns about water infrastructure in the Southern Sierra and the San Joaquin Valley following uh, the, the inundations last winter and the very high flows. There's still some water uh, in, in the, 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 the temporary inland sea in, in parts of the San Joaquin Valley. There are concerns over seepage uh, under uh, Isabella Dam, for example. So this is a pretty significant thing uh, that in the context of what has recently occurred, and it is the single most likely outcome for Central and Southern California. So I think that from a risk and hazard management perspective, that is probably what we need to be focusing on this year, because the consequences of a somewhat dry winter would not necessarily be severe this year because of what we got last year, but the consequences of a particularly wet one could be quite significant, and that is the single most likely outcome. So from a management perspective, that maybe gives us some useful information. If you want to know what's going to happen this winter, well, you know, if you're going to, to bet on, on modest skew, skews in the odds, then I would go to wet, but I wouldn't put too much money on it because honestly, any of these outcomes are still possible. The other thing I wanted to point out from this up map on the upper left, although it's not regarding California, is the high likelihood, in fact, there is more confidence that the uh, January through March period in both the Pacific Northwest, British Columbia, and Hawaii will be drier than average. In fact, that will fall in the lowest, the driest third of all such periods. Then there is confidence that California will fall in the wettest third of periods. So there's a tilt in the odds in California towards wet, but there's a strong tilt in the odds in the Pacific Northwest and Hawaii towards dry or very dry. So what's interesting is that the there's asymmetry in the confidence here. There, there I, 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 would, uh, I would be more confident, in other words, putting money on a dry winter in Seattle uh, or Honolulu uh, than I would on a wet winter in Los Angeles, even though all of those would be the favored outcomes this year. So interesting talk about probability and talked about probabilistic modeling and predictions before. I think the challenge is that Again, we know the effect of El Nino. I think most of what we're seeing on these plots and in these probabilistic outlooks is mainly the influence of El Nino, but as it's interacting with this very unusual or unprecedented configuration of non-tropical ocean warmth. And I don't think anybody knows exactly how that's going to play out. It's been a very dramatic summer. Weather forecasts have been pretty good, but seasonal outlooks have not been so good. So honestly, this winter uh, you know, has the potential to have some pretty big Surprises, I think, for Central and Southern California, particularly given that this would be the second very wet winter if it occurs, and that potentially increases the stakes for the Central and Southern Sierra in particular, and some other parts of Southern California, including some desert regions that are probably going to be recovering from flooding this summer in Southern Nevada and Southeastern California for months to come or longer. So any heavy rain that falls this winter would interfere or potentially uh, cause major setbacks in, in, the, in that recovery in those regions. So food for thought, I'll continue to follow this. It still is September, it's relatively early, things could change, but I don't think they'll change dramatically. The models may either converge on increasing likelihood of a wet winter in California, or they might start to diverge even further as we get closer. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Again, if I had to choose a single outcome, I'd say I would put money on an unusually wet winter in Central and Southern California in particular, perhaps in the whole state. Uh, but uh, again, that's a probabilistic uh, outlook, subject to change, and it does not rule out any other outcome, including a dry winter. 
but I think we should be focusing on the wet winter given the conditional potential consequences of seeing one this year are greater than that of a dry winter. All right, so let me pull those off the screens uh, to, to so there's fewer visual distractions. And then I want to answer questions. I know I've, I've spoken for a fairly long time, uh, but let's, let's go through the questions. Uh, and I'm going to take a quick look at them now, so bear with me as I pause and scan. Uh, glad the sound got better. I just need to... Um, it always defaults to a really low level for some reason, so I need to figure out a way to make those settings stick or maybe just check them every time. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, a comment from Swiftbird that Hillary, presumably Hillary's, uh, Tropical Storm Hillary's rains really caused an unseasonal weed problem in West Ugly Valley, California. I don't actually know where that is, uh, but um, it's quite a quite quite a name, and I'm not too surprised. You know, weeds are often, um, especially invasives, can be kind of responsive to aseasonal precipitation. Uh, there are a, a lot of the native vegetation, uh, especially the native grasses. Uh, they don't often, except in some parts. There, I should I take that back? Uh, it really depends where you are. There's a lot of native plants in California, especially grasses, that don't really have a sec second growth period in response to aseasonal precipitation. But there's a lot of invasive plants and grasses that do have that response. And in some regions, there probably are even some pockets of uh, native grasses that can have that second, second wave. Um, weeds are, of course, different than grasses in many cases, and so um, you're probably not the only person who noticed that. It really has been extraordinarily damp for summer in the Southern Sierra and parts of Southern California, the deserts, which are pretty green right now if you've gotten a chance to go down there. Some of the roads are still closed. They were washed out due to flooding earlier this summer, but in places where everything's open, um, I don't know if it's super bloom level of flowers, but the greenness of the vegetation, you know, the desert vegetation is really responsive to precipitation if and when it occurs, and boy has it occurred this year. So, you know, it, it's, it's visibly noticeable. You can see it from satellite imagery. You can certainly see it if you're there on the ground. Um, pretty cool stuff. Let's see. A right, question from Eric. Is there any historical data for sea surface temperatures prior to March 11 from areas east of Japan? Yes, of course. These, uh, these sea surface temperature data sets go back much farther than that. So. This encompasses decades of uh, those maps. The, the map I was showing originally is uh, the current departure from average relative to recent decades of average. So the short answer is yes, it does there and everywhere else as well. Um, why is it blurry? Well, hopefully it's not too blurry for other folks. I can see that there is maybe a little bit of degraded quality that might have something to do with the streaming bitrate that I've adjusted downward to prevent interruptions. Uh, I do have a, we're having a, a second internet provider installed next week, so who knew that live streaming would be so expensive, but the, uh, hopefully uh, that may be a faster upload. I might be able to increase quality because it's a fiber service, so the upload speeds are supposedly 10 to 50 times faster than you can get via legacy ISPs. So if that actually happens, I can probably significantly increase uh, uh, the, the bit rate and the upload quality. So uh, by this time next week, perhaps, you'll see an improvement. Uh, I guess I'm solving one problem at a time. Today, I think the the visual artifacts have gone away and there haven't been any stream interruptions, so I'm going to call that a win for now. Uh, a good question from Seth. What do the models say regarding temperature, temperature over winter? I can't take another epic snow winter in Tahoe. Uh, well, the good news is part of what happened last year is it was just an extraordinary combination of one of the coldest winters in Northern California in several decades, which is saying a lot in a warming climate, and one of the wettest winters on record in the Southern and Central Sierra simultaneously. It's not often we see both of those things at once. It was kind of a unique combination. Uh, 
in many decades. Uh, even though I do think there is an above average likelihood that the southern and central Sierra will see above average precipitation this winter, it's likelier on average to be warmer storms than last year for two reasons. One is that the storms last winter were exceptionally cold storms in many cases, given how much moisture they had. And with El Nino, because a lot of what happens in central and southern California is the enhancement by the subtropical jet stream, it doesn't necessarily mean you see lots of extremely warm atmospheric rivers, but it means that you see relatively few cold storms. So they may not be exceptionally warm storms. We certainly could see some, but I wouldn't expect all of them to be. What we might almost completely get rid of this winter are the super cold storms we saw last winter with very low elevation snowfall in some cases or extraordinarily heavy fluffy white snow accumulation at, at middle and high elevation. So I would expect that the mean snow line this winter would be well above last winter's uh, and you might even see some heavy rain events up to lake level again this year rather than heavy snow events. I'm sure there'll be some snow events at lake level but I don't think it's going to be this continuous onslaught of, of, of just massive accumulations down to like three to 5,000 feet. I think that's quite unlikely this winter. Now, if you happen to live up at eight or 9,000 feet, it might be a very different story. There probably will be, uh, there could be, I should say, pretty epic snow accumulations up at those very high uh, top of the chairlift, top of the mountain type elevations. So there are a few folks who live up that high in California, not very many, no major cities or towns, but there are some folks so it could be a very big year up above eight or 9,000 feet, probably not an extraordinary snow year in the more middle elevation zones, and I would expect a lower than average likelihood of uh, very wet conditions, excuse me, a lower than average likelihood of very snowy conditions at low elevations this year. So I, it's less likely that we'd see a repeat, uh, in fact, it's very unlikely we'd see a repeat of last winter with lots of low elevation snow and then tremendous amounts of middle elevation snow. We could still get tremendous amounts of very high elevation snow. In fact, I think that's quite likely. Up at eight, nine, 10,000 feet in the Southern Sierra, uh, massive amounts of snow are a distinct possibility. But I think on average, where most people live, this is not gonna be as problematic of a snow year in terms of dealing with the, the volume uh, that we saw last winter. So uh, hopefully good news. Um, for some folks who had uh, had it rough last year. A question from Daniel: uh, What are the chances that Santa Ana conditions, so Santa Ana winds, the you know the the offshore drying winds in Southern California, could dry up the excess moisture across the region and increase fire risk before the season is over? That is a possibility particularly if uh, we end up seeing a relatively dry October or November in Southern California, which is very much a possibility, unless there's another tropical remnant event, then it could end up being pretty dry in Southern California. And if we do see those offshore winds, we've seen this before. We've even seen it in winter, actually, in Southern California, uh, where strong offshore winds can create fire risk even following significant rainfall. So it's a bit different from Northern California, where that rarely happens after the first significant rain or two of the season, it can occasionally happen in Southern California. So there is there is um, some possibility uh, that that might occur. Um, it's probably less likely than usual, just given how damp it is, there would have to be a lot of drying, but it's not impossible. So, you know, I think we've learned in recent years, never say never when it comes to California wildfire conditions. Although on the other hand, as far as we can tell, this year is 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 continuing to track on the on, on the mild side. So, absent some pretty significant weather event, that's sort of what I, or I would expect it to remain. Um, especially, and by the time we do get to winter in Southern California, as I mentioned, January through March, the, the are pretty significant odds of wetter than usual conditions. So by that point, I think the the likelihood of, of fire uh, fire driving offshore winds are are pretty minimal. Is there a chance of a ridge forming over the northeastern Pacific and steering storms uh, up into Alaska? I mean, yes, that's always a possibility. In fact, I can guarantee you it'll happen at least transiently during the winter since it happens every year, at least briefly. Will it sort of be a seasonal scale signature? Probably not. This is one of those years where the El Nino forcing 
will likely prevent that from happening due to the deepening of, of the Gulf of Alaska low. If California doesn't end up seeing wet conditions this winter, I don't think it's going to be because there's a huge ridge right along the west coast. It would be the failure mode. Again, I have been doing this lately is uh, hypothesizing how I might be wrong. Uh, if, if we don't end up seeing a wider than average winter in central and southern California, I would expect it to be uh, mainly because uh, of potential subtropical ridging, so a sort of an interruption in the subtropical jet stream. So the subtropical jet will almost certainly be enhanced across the central North Pacific and then again uh, over, uh, over the southeastern United States. But there may be a little bit of a gap uh, in that enhancement near California. And if that gap is complete, that might be the failure mode where storms just don't strengthen as much as they would otherwise or they kind of fall apart as they get close to California. That would be, if we do see not a wet winter in California this year. I don't think it's because we're going to see a gigantic ridge that completely deflects storms away from California, but it would be more likely for that kind of reason. There might be some ridging actually up in British Columbia and the Pacific Northwest, so there might actually be a ridge to our north with undercutting storms making it into central and southern California. This is why far northern California is more of an edge case during even strong El Nino events because you can either end up really wet if the subtropical jet sort of uh, wiggles around a bit and sprays north and south California with a lot of extra moisture with winter storms, or it can be more part of the Pacific Northwest influence if that, uh, that, that lack of storms uh, due to a weaker a northern branch of the jet stream up in the Pacific Northwest kind of is more influential in far northern California than it can be dry up there. So that's why I don't really have strong feelings about the northern third of California this winter to the same extent as I feel that southern and central California are, are pretty likely to see wet conditions. Not so sure what might happen in the northern third. Pretty sure the Pacific Northwest is going to be dry. The northern third of California kind of falls in between uh, in the zone where it could go either way. Uh, and so it may be yet another place where the likelihood of conditions near average or lower than usual because it's most likely to either fall uh, on, the, on the wet side or the dry side rather than in the middle. So uh, it will be interesting to see what happens. There's also, again, as I mentioned, there's a bit of a wild card. We'll see how well the seasonal models are handling these essentially novel, unprecedented combinations of ocean surface temperatures uh, with the tropics and the mid-latitudes. So... The most honest answer is we, we just don't know for sure. El Nino would disfavor uh, a big ridge that blocks storms from making it to California, but these other factors might, uh, might have a different effect. Yeah, I got, got some notes that the video is not blurry, but it is washed out. That I do see and I agree with, and so uh, I, I need to... Uh, sort of figure out uh, the, the the details there. In fact, while I'm thinking about it, let's just see if I can briefly uh, adjust the white balance so that it's not quite so washed out. Uh, let's see here. Aha, here we go. Adjusting the brightness downward. Let's see if this works. Uh, some nifty software to change on the fly. Looks like it might be working. Uh, testing, testing. Cranking it down. There we go. Okay, so now I'm a little bit overly shadowy. I might need to find a, a balance next time. But for now, uh, it's nice to know that this is, in fact, adjustable. So I will try and add some... I mentioned some better background lights, some some better uh, some better sound insulation, and that should uh, improve the quality of the studio. So I'll play around with that later. Um, yeah, so I've gotten a few questions along these lines. Uh, so I, I, I figure it's worth addressing uh, since there's not too much more coming in. So a question from Eric about uh, the effect of uh, the Fukushima nuclear meltdown and the subsequent release of uh, uh, of contaminated water in the Pacific Ocean. I actually get this question a lot, disproportionately much. Um, it surprises me. Uh, 
but so, but I, you know, I think it's worth addressing since I do, I do get this question a lot. I think there's a perception that some of uh, the this this water that's being released from, and again, just to remind everybody, th- this was the nuclear power plant in Japan that underwent uh, a, a, a nuclear meltdown in the wake of the great 9.0 earthquake and subsequent devastating tsunami. So the plant made it fine through the earthquake and then because they put the backup generators in the basement, which flooded during the subsequent tsunami, um, the plant lost cooling ability and did eventually melt down with a couple of hydrogen explosions uh, uh, that that contaminated the landscape. The cooling water that that they were able to uh, bring back into use was essentially just seawater that they pumped up from the ocean to keep the reactors cool. That has worked, but it has generated a huge amount of radiologically contaminated ocean water that has had to have been stored on site in giant tanks. There's these massive tank farm with somewhat radioactive seawater that has been sitting there now for years. It's been over a decade now. And they essentially don't have room for it anymore. They've got to do something. They've got to keep cooling it. Uh, It's an interesting engineering uh, and uh, sort of a radiological emergency conversation, but the the short version of it is that they started releasing some of that water back into the Pacific recently because there's just nowhere else realistically to to put it. So they're minimally treating it and releasing it into the Pacific. And there is some low concentration of radioisotopes in that ocean water that wouldn't be in that ocean water otherwise. But I think that there's a perception that somehow this water is like massively thermally hot or that there's so much of it that it's affecting like global ocean currents or weather. And I just want to point out that this ocean water, it's not hot. It's not warmer than, it, than, than this water would normally be, first of all, because uh, this is water that's just been sitting in tanks for a while. So although there is elevated levels of certain radioisotopes above background levels, it's not it's not causing the ocean water to warm up. Uh, the concentration is is just extremely low. And, you know, I don't love the phrase, the solution to pollution is dilution, but there is, especially at the scale of the global ocean, uh, it is true that the, that, that the releasing tiny volumes of water relative to the total volume of the ocean has an infinitesimally small effect on the total volume of water. So this is a pretty common question. The answer is, is this water even warmer than the background ocean temperature? No, but even if it was, it would only be affecting a tiny area, like like like, like hundreds of meters uh, out from the point that it was, it was released because again, the thermal capacity of the deep vast ocean is almost incomprehensibly large. So, you know, you, 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 you pour, you know, even thousands of gallons of boiling water into the ocean, right? And you're not going to even notice that effect more than, you know, a couple tens of feet away. And even then, if you stop doing it, it's going to, that, that thermal effect is going to dissipate within minutes. Not because it was a small amount of energy, but because the amount of, the thermal capacity of the whole ocean at large is just so massively larger that, it, that it's, it's less, it's really literally less than a drop in the bucket. So A, that water is not warmer than regular ocean water to begin with. B, uh, it's it, it, it's such a tiny volume in comparison to even the volume of the bay that it's being released into that it wouldn't have that large of an effect anyway, even if it were very hot water. And so C, no, it's not having an effect at all on even very local weather, let alone global climate. So, and I say that with very high confidence, just because there is no plausible mechanism for that water to affect large scales. Uh, let's see. And one last question. Uh, let's see. Um, I'll, I'll merge two questions, one from Noah and one further down. Um, essentially, the, the, the highest odds of wet conditions, as, as I mentioned, are in central and southern California. In the mountain watersheds, that really means from the central and southern Sierra southward. So there's not a strong signal for a very wet winter in the northern Sierra. So in terms of flood risk concerns, that would probably be the southern Sierra and the San Joaquin Delta in particular. 
that would be of most concern, particularly, as I mentioned, given what happened last year, given what's the residual water that's still there, the residual moisture, and some of the infrastructure concerns that arose in the wake of what happened last winter. So that is definitely where my concerns would be higher. There is evidence that strong El Nino events not only increase the odds of seasonal wet conditions, but also of individual extreme winter storm events. So, uh, you know, there is an increased odds both for a wet winter and for individual extreme storms. And of course, climate change has increased the background likelihood of very heavy precipitation events on top of that. And this year, that's going to be partly manifested by those really warm ocean surface temperatures in the extra tropical Pacific that sort of, as I mentioned, might add more juice to the atmosphere for those storms that do make it through. So, uh, you know, yes, I, I, I do think that there's an elevated risk this winter of flooding in the Southern Sierra and the San Joaquin Delta in particular. I'm not so sure that there's clearly increased risk farther north, but that is subject to change. But in particular, both based on what has already happened, so the antecedent conditions and what the outlook looks like for this winter, I would say that my, uh, my suggestion for increased vigilance and preparation would definitely be centered uh, in the southern half of the, the, those watersheds, so the San Joaquin watershed, southern and maybe central Sierra as well, as parts of southern California that have been pretty wet as well. But of course, you don't have quite as large of drainages and watersheds in most of southern California. You have flashier rivers that are still susceptible to flooding and could be at risk this winter. But in terms of the responsiveness to the antecedent conditions, that's, that's really going to be most pronounced in the San Joaquin Delta, I think. All right, everybody. Well, it looks like I've made it through another whole session without a cutout in the actual uh, contiguity of the stream, which is great. Looks like I've gotten rid of the visual artifacts, so maybe it was the camera. I guess so I guess I did need a new one. Uh, now I need to deal with the white balance issue, which is probably the easiest thing I've had to deal with so far, and address uh, the, uh, the sound echoing, which is something I'll do through rim modification. So at this point, I think I might actually be able to solve these things by next week. So um, next week, perhaps, uh, conversation will be via fiber connection, and I can increase the bandwidth. That would be great. But even if not, this is better than it was, uh, and it should be um, continuing to improve. So thanks again for your continued support. I really appreciate it. Uh, and uh, yeah, stay tuned for continuing uh, revamps of the channel. Um, I know there's a lot of people who engage with this deeply right now, and there's a lot more people who engage, by the way, when there's ex individual extreme events ongoing and when I'm doing some of the live sessions walking people through individual storms. Those definitely seem to be the best well-attended, uh, the, the, the most attended sessions. So I'll try and do more of those. I will also eventually be doing more um, structured conversations, doing interviews. I've put one of those out so far. There may be more to come. They'll be irregular and infrequent, but I, but I, I think it's a good idea. Uh, and I know folks expressed interest in seeing both types of content when I originally surveyed everybody. So uh, I think uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, I expect I'll probably be doing a number of major storm event live streams uh, this winter if, my, if the seasonal outlook holds for Central and Southern California in particular. Uh, I'm glad I don't f foresee it likely that I'm going to be doing, you know, last minute emergency extreme wildfire kind of live streams this fall. I guess you never know, but that does not appear to be likely uh, this fall. So that's the good news. But there might be a lot more to talk about come January, February, and March. So uh, for now, uh, stay tuned. Uh, I'm going to get on that blog post. If you want more details, feel free to read it later. It should be published by early evening. Uh, and uh, I'll talk to you all next time.